So these were like places in the hood where I grew up, community centers, and all of a sudden I was working in these places and offering classes and becoming like a faculty. And it felt really nice. I, I, I enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it because it just made me, I'd have to prepare. In order to prepare for a lecture series, I got to go through and organize my information. And I really enjoyed it. It ended up being something that to this day, I never stopped. I never stopped enjoying. And it's like half of what I do. Mm -hmm. and, and I really enjoy it. It's for me, I'm, I'm, I'm an investigator around it. And I have the resource here. And so it allows me to dig into my own resources, into my collection, and find these gems that are there that I'm discovering. I don't know in my head 100% mm -hmm. of the stuff that I have just right here in the house. Not to speak of you know how it's opened up in the world. There's a lot of information out there now. So I ended up teaching because of that, you know, just because there was a little demand for it and the ball started rolling and I realized I can make a little bit of income doing it, but also mo first and foremost, I really enjoy teaching. I, I, I really say, and I've always said, I realized it immediately and to this day I feel no differently that, that the teacher is the one who learns the most in, in any teaching situation. Mm. I really feel that. I, I notice that every time I have to prepare for a class or for a series, I got to dig in and, and get my stuff together. And that just brings my knowledge up. You know, as part of your studies, you, you mentioned that this region doesn't really have a, a rich population of Puerto Ricans or Cubans, mm -hmm. unlike the East Coast, Miami, New York, where you're steeped in it. Um, so it was hard to find that. One of the things that was unique to this region was people were willing to make at the time was a very dip, difficult diplomatic political decision to actually go to Cuba and study in the 70s and 80s. That was not a popular thing to do. It was very difficult to do. It uh, put you in the crosshairs of, you know, a government that was involved in Iran-Contra and a whole bunch of other very difficult Latin American situations at the time. But you were one of those people who decided that you were going to go to Cuba in your case, for academic concerns. Um, tell me about your first trip to Cuba and, mm -hmm. and what that was like for you as an educator and a performer. Well, I want to I, I, I wanna back up to set that up a little bit because what you're saying is very true about, about uh, the Cuban qu question because one of the things about being in the West Coast was that we didn't have access to the Cubans and the Cuban community and even the Puerto Rican community to, to that extent that was in New York. But by the same token, New York was super, was super charged with this political thing. And so there were, you know, the exile Cuban community really controlled, you know, the, the work and stuff. So, you know, we were marginalized politically in a way and there's a there's uh, musicians in new york had to face that too you know i think of jerry gonzalez and andy and then them and they're very progressive and mm -hmm. they had to deal with that in new york but out here we we, we kind of had a little more free reign to speak our mind about that and to be a little bit more you know or i should say a little bit less guarded we didn't have to automatically take the party line in order to work because it wasn't the exile Cuban community that was giving us work. Mm -hmm. So we, um, you know, were a little bit more open about it and people would travel and, you know, Greg Landau was one of the first of our, of our crew to go to Cuba and Mike Rios too, the great painter, the muralist. Mike mm -hmm. went to Cuba. Yeah, um, Greg Landau's a local uh, record producer, prolific mm -hmm. producer. Yes, indeed. Mm -hmm. And uh, he went, um, and, and you know, they, they brought back music too, and, and went with a very open and progressive kind of attitude around it. And so, you know, having never lived in Cuba and not being Cuban, you know, I, I never have been one to take a hard line on one side or the other. I have a lot of friends that I respect on both sides of the, of the political question, and I try to be respectful of them both. I know people who are extreme on both levels who get upset because they think I'm too far in one direction or the other. But I think that that kind of um, open-mindedness, though, allowed us to be open and receive the music in Cuba and, and, and look for it mm -hmm. and look at, for, at it with an open mind and, and incorporate it into what we do. So we, at that time in the 70s, we, we actually uh, incorporated a lot of Cuban music into our repertoire mm -hmm. that was contemporary Cuban music that wasn't being listened to or heard in this country much at all. Um, a lot of it wa was blackballed by the exile Cuban community mm -hmm. and um, but we had access because we had people bringing us music. Mm -hmm. So then in 1976, Los Papinas were the first group to break the blockade. And the first place, the first stop on their tour of the United States was Oakland. And the band I had at the time 
was the Orquesta Típica Sin Fuegos, and we played, we opened for them. It was 77, I said, not 76, 77. And we opened the show for them, so we got to meet them, our heroes, you know, and and play with them. There was a jam at the end, and we played, and Armando Peraza was there, and we all played together. We had a beautiful experience meeting Los Papines, and, and just, you know, tasting that forbidden fruit, so to speak, of these Cuban groups coming to the United States for the first time. The following year, the Grupo Moncada came in 78, and they also played in Oakland, and we got to open for them too, because the group I had was kind of known for, for its Cuban repertoire, and we had a kind of a progressive look at Cuban music, and so we got to open for these Cuban groups when they would come. That happened several times. So that's what kind of set me up. Uh, that was in the 70s. Then throughout the 80s, uh, we had the group Batachanga, as you mentioned, and um, and Machete Ensemble formed in the mid 80s. And it wasn't until 1990 that I made made it to Cuba for the first time. So by that time, 1990, I mean, I was already um, 35 years old when I went for the first time. And I had a lot of experience around Cuban music and knew a lot about the history of the music because of my studies. And I found that when I went to Cuba, I felt at home. Mm -hmm. I, I went to Cuba and, and, and felt really, really like I had been there before because I was so familiar with a lot of the musicians and artists and the music. And the place, of course, looks and feels like Puerto Rico. It's the same, mm -hmm. you know, Caribbean kind of climate and island and that same look, that Creole flavor everywhere and mulatas and, and people of all colors. And so I felt so much at home there. That, I, that's, that's what struck me the most, mm -hmm. is that um, it didn't feel like a foreign country to me mm -hmm. somehow, you mm -hmm. know. And I had a great time. I met some wonderful friends. I told you about the experience with Ernesto Oviedo. I met him. I met Lali uh, Gonzalez, a great timbero, who uh, to this day is a great friend. Mm -hmm. And I had wonderful experiences. I met people who really took me around. And, and, and things just unfolded in an amazing way every day. I was there for a month, one month. Two weeks, the first two weeks, I took a dance course. The first dance class I ever took in my life was a two-week dance course called Folk Cuba with the National Folklore Troupe of Cuba. And that's to dance all the popular and folklore dances. So that was quite an experience for me. Wow. Beautiful experience. I was really excited about, about trying to catch up in the area of dance. Mm -hmm. I had always danced, you know, a mi manera. You know, and I could dance a little bit, but I wasn't a great dancer. And, and I was excited about becoming one. I wanted to become one. I had a lot of experience with the music, but I always was on stage playing. I was never dancing. And when the bands would come from the from out of town, I'd be up watching. I wouldn't be dancing, you know what I mean? <laughs> so I was behind. And I went there, and I made some great friends around that time and, and around that uh, experience. You know, the, the drummers in the National Folklore Troupe were great drummers. Most of them, most of them were folkloric drummers. They were not schooled. They were not from the conservatory at that time. And they, uh, there were a lot of people from the Bay Area there on that trip. Mm -hmm. And um, one, I remember they approached me, a couple of the teachers, and they said, after the first week, we heard that you're a percussionist, that you're a professional percussionist. And yeah, how come you're not studying with us? You know, like who do you think you are that you're not studying with us? You know, they gave me that that thing. So I, I, I told them. Uh, you know, you guys all dance, right? Yeah. I go, well, I, I don't. And I know that a drummer needs to know how to dance. You have to, you, you, what do you know about these rhythms if you can't dance to them? You've got to know how to dance to play them correctly. And I've never taken a dance class. And I've been playing now. I've been playing, I'm 35 years old. I've been playing since I was 12. And I have a lot of experience playing. I know that I can learn a lot from you. But I can learn a lot also watching you. Because when I'm taking the dance class, you guys are playing. And I'm watching. I'm learning. Right. So it was the right answer. They were very right. happy with that. They, sure. gave, they gave me a lot. They said, okay, that makes sense. And they, uh, they took me under their wing also. And I, I learned a great deal with them, you know, just watching. Because, you know, if I was in the classes, the classes are geared toward beginners. And so the classes would have been a little bit slow for right. me. But, but as a dancer and just playing to them playing, just observing, I learned a ton sure, watching sure, these sure. guys play. So I had a great time. I met all these people that I already knew because I had seen endless amount of video footage of Cuban groups. So most of the musicians I ran into, I, I seen them before. I, I, right. I knew who they were. Like I'd come up, I was amazing a lot of these Cubans because we'd walk up to people in the street and I'd go, that's such and such. That's such. And they go, how do you know that? You know, God, I seen it. I got a video with him on it from Cuban TV or from a documentary. And so I got to meet all these people and just talk to them. And, and they took, they really opened their arms for me and beautiful experience. 
Well, one thing I've learned about you is some people can argue ball scores or when when this or that happened. Don't get into an argument with John Santos about music or who played it or when they did it or who was on it, right? Well, I got I got some some backup. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the one thing I wanted to talk to you about, especially in today's contemporary world of uh, you know streaming radio companies and streaming media. We hear a lot of, you know, Taylor Swift, she's taking her music off Spotify. And Jay-Z, he's starting his own, you know, music company because he wants to... Um, you have done something radical. You, you, you've been your own publisher now for 30 years. You've produced over, I think I counted, 18 separate CDs. Am, am I on track there? I think, something like that. I think it's 20, but I'm not 20? sure. Something like that. Uh, a couple of score, let's say, in, in <clears throat> biblical terms. Um, but you made the radical decision uh, last year not only to obviously create your own website, but be the only place that people could buy your music. Uh, because you figure after 30 years of having a record label and 20 separate productions, um, you know, things would be going well. But as an artist, you realized uh, you needed to take the, the reins yourself. Tell me about that, and, and what what's it like in today's world to try to be a band leader and a and a an, uh, record publisher and still still make it in this world? Yeah, you know that um, whole question of, about the business is um, it's important, and it's um, it's a big part of my career. But you know it's. Um, it's got its pros and cons, its ups and downs. It's got it's 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 an important part though that I think everybody has to come to terms with in some way at some point. And for me, after the first record experience of 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 getting a record label to sign you, which was in 1981, when um, the group at the Changa started, <clears throat> I actually had been invited to be part of that group. And I, I had to decline because I, at that time I had I had recently injured my hand playing basketball and I had a cyst in my hand on the nerve, which eventually I had to get operated to remove. But um, I couldn't I couldn't play, so I wasn't there. But in the meantime, they got an offer for a record deal, and then they called me back again and said, "Look, we got a record deal. We'd like to ask you to produce the record for us." And so I ended up co-producing it along with Michael Spiral. Michael, it was Michael's first. Uh, a project of that type also and Mike was new to town and we, um, we 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 did a nice job with that I thought you know it was for our first production and we had this experience with this guy who owned the record label and it was a, it was a disaster mm. you know in the end in the end we weren't happy financially it was a bust and everything great that we got to document what we were up to at that time and we got the participation of Orestes Vilato and Armando Peraza and um, uh, uh, Danny, no, Jimmy Bosch was on the first record. Jimmy Bosch mm -hmm. was on that record, and we, uh, you know, it was a, it was a good record, and it's the first recording for for a lot of us, um, you know, uh, for Anthony Blea, for Rebecca Mauleon, you know, it was a starting of career Callaway as well, um, you know, it was an important step for us to document, but it was a disaster from a business and economic side. So immediately I recognized that I said, you know, I, you know, it was a dream come true. A record deal. We got a record deal. We got signed. You know, like, that's supposed to be like a big deal, and it was it was a it was a turd. So, you know, for the second record, I um, I, I, I decided, you know, I'm gonna form my own label. And I'm gonna put it out myself. I'll, I'll learn how to do it. It can't be that hard, you know. <laughs> Little did I know. But, <laughs> you know, I, I didn't want to be burned. I wanted to, if, you know, if I, if it was gonna fail, I wanted to fail on my own and and at least know that whatever. 10 records get sold, then we get paid for it, you know, instead of this other mystery kind of thing. So I decided to form the company in 84, um, and, and it was also weird, controversial, because Batachanga was breaking up. And I uh, was the leader at that time of Batachanga, and I, and I proposed to them, look, you know, uh, um, I'm, you know we've kind of hit the ceiling here, and we can't get a, uh, we haven't been having success getting another record deal. Uh, Anthony's going to go to New York, and uh, you know all these things are happening. I'm ready to step down. If anybody wants to like take over, assume the leadership, feel free to do it. Nobody wanted to, because there was a lot of work to do that to book the group and organize everything. So nobody wanted to do it. Now I said, but I would like to record the band before we break up, 
and people are like, what? Are you crazy? Why? Why would we do that? Break, do, make a recording and, and you, you've lost your mind and then break up. I go, no, for real, because the band has come a long way in the couple years that, went, that we've been playing. Right. And I think the band sounds good and I, wanna, I think it's important to document it. We have a document of what the band sounded like at the beginning and we should have one now at the end. And I'm gonna, and so people were like, oh, I'm complaining, people were not, they didn't react, the reaction, the knee-jerk reaction was not positive on, on the part of just about everybody. And the, so I just said, you know, I'm gonna do it. Whoever wants to do it, please, you know, do it with me. You're welcome to do it. But I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna get it done. I'm gonna do it. I, I think it's important. And I would, and it would, it would not be the same without ev all of you. But I'm gonna do it. So I'm gonna, I've set the day. Boom, boom, boom. Everybody came, of course, and everybody did it. The recording, and it's a beautiful record. I'm so proud of that record. Mm -hmm. The second record by Batachanga, for me, is really, I think. Um, it shows, again, it shows the dedication we had as, as students of the music. The group had come a long way. I think that the writing and the playing, the soloing, the energy shows a lot of sophistication for our age, mm -hmm. for the, as old as we were. And everybody was like in their 20s. I mean, that was in, that was in the early 80s. So yeah, everybody, everybody was in their 20s and some of them were teenagers like, like uh, Blea. So, you know, I'm glad we did it. It was the first one I put on my own label. And now here we are 30 years later, fast forward, and um, a couple times in that period of time, I decided it's too much work. It's too much work. You gotta deal with the copyright, the legal part, the administration, the, you know, getting the record done and paid for. It's like such a major job for a staff of people. And I, I was doing it by myself, that work. And it took me out of practicing, out of, composing and the, the part that I really wanted to do. It, it separated me from that. So a couple times I went back and said, I got an offer, somebody sweet talked me and said, oh yeah, and they seem cool, boom, and I signed with a label. Every time we got burned, every time I did that. We did it, I think, two or three times. And I got burned. So I, I came back finally, you know, in, in 2002 or something around that time, and uh, had just come off of a bad experience with a record label. And we did the SF Bay record. And uh, so I put that back on my own label and we got a Grammy nomination. It was the only one that Machete got. But you know, that, that it was encouraging to at least get a nomination, get a little recognition. And, and, and you know, since then I haven't uh, done anything other than on my own label. But it is, you know, having to be a businessman is again, not what I intended to do. And I'm not a great businessman. I learned a lot about the business. But because I'm a player, you know, I'm not dedicating myself to that either. I'm a little bit of a jack of all trades, and so mm. I'm a master of none, you know, as they say. But I learned enough to how to read a contract, how to negotiate, you know, and how to what to, you know how to negotiate when you're booking the band. And I learned a lot of valuable lessons that have served me to this to this moment. So having the label and celebrating 30 year anniversary of the label. To me, that, that is an important step. It's an important thing that, that, that it hasn't gone under, that at least it's not making any money. But at least, you know, we have this catalog that 90% of it we own, and we can, I can do what I want to do with it, you know? Right. And, and over the years, I think it increases in value. But of course, there's a whole other aspect of that now, that everything's digital and all this uh, stuff about rights and getting paid for the music. It's a whole dark phase that we're in right now where everybody's getting the music and wants the music for free and you know that's a whole dilemma that we're trying to deal with now mm -hmm. uh, i've got a lot of music in the can that i would have loved to put out a couple of years ago i got about four cds worth of material that i've recorded over the past few years up until this year <coughs> but it's not practical anymore to put out a cd right. because nobody buys cds but yet i don't have the heart to put out a digital release digital only and then that brings me to this question that you, where you started, was about the website. And I, I want to put out the, the website, and I started that project, as you know, and I haven't pulled the trigger on it yet, because there's all these little quirky things that are coming up about the quality, about if you're going to do high-def audio, mm. and what it's going to cost, and um, trying to get all the bugs out and make sure it's going to work well, and that it's going to be possible to pull off before I dive off the cliff. So, you know, John, you make a good point in, in today's world that that world that we grew up in, uh, making it was that record labels contract, making it was being on vinyl and being heard on the radio. In today's world, artists experience all of that, and yet they see very little or no return. 
So here's the challenge, you know, we as a performance organization spend a lot of time in education and training young people to play an instrument and empowering them through music to become uh, better human beings, uh, better uh, academicians, better workers. Um, many of them want to grow up and be just like you. You know, what advice would you give uh, a young musician who, like you, uh, has collected your work, uh, you know, you're that master they recognize on the street, you're that person they get excited about when they finally meet you. What do you tell somebody who truly, the world needs their art yeah. about how to uh, be an artist in today's world? Well, I think they have to attack it head on. You know, it can't be like a hobby. You know, for a lot of years, when I was learning and in the teenage years, it was nothing but fun. It was hobby. And I was probably more serious than most because I was spending a lot of time digging into my collection and reading and listening and studying. But there was also a lot of partying going on and it was and it was and it was it felt like a hobby. It didn't feel like a job or anything like that. And you gotta kind of apply it. You gotta keep you know, it's a balance, but you have to keep your joy around it and keep that it childlike kind of approach of, of just being excited about it and love it. But you really got to study because the, 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 the competition is incredible. But the opportunities now with the internet and the, and the generations now that uh, are internet savvy, which I am not and never have been. And so I came in at kind of a funny time because, you know, if my computer skills and were, were like more up in the past few decades, I could be a lot further along, you know, career-wise in terms of economic success and what have you. And I think that makes a big difference. You have to be versatile. You gotta. You have to love it. You have to be versatile. You have to dedicate yourself to it. But you have to inform yourself. And you do need to learn the business. I think a lot of musicians make the mistake um, of trying to still have that attitude. And in the past, in the old days, a lot of jazz musicians uh, in particular, but all kinds of musicians, had no interest in learning the business. They just wanted to play. And so they would leave it to anybody else. They'd sign whatever contract and sign all the rights away and sign, get into problems with that because they just wanted to play. For some of them, maybe that worked and they just barely survived making a few dollars playing, but they just love to play. It's all they want to do every day, play, and so, okay. But if you, want, if you want to kind of have a little more success and maybe, you know, uh, be able to support a family and a home and what have you, through the music, then you have to step it up and you have to know the business. If you don't know the business, you're going to get burned. If you don't know the business, you're going to sign contracts that you shouldn't be signing. And if you don't know the business, you're, you're going to be selling yourself for a lot cheaper than you should be, etc. So I think it's really important that the musicians take advantage of the position they're in nowadays to learn the business and use the internet to their advantage and really use the social media in the way that it's the most effective and the most powerful. And I say that not really knowing how to do those things myself, just knowing of the power of it and knowing with what little I've delved into those areas that it's helped a lot and I see the potential of it. Mm -hmm. But I, I know that um, somebody who's really savvy in that combined with the talent and the heart and the dedication, that's really the only formula I think that's gonna work in terms of, of uh, making a, a profession and uh, out of this kind of, in particular this kind of music and that, as that comes out of my mouth, I have to say, you can't just dedicate yourself to one kind of music. You really have to be versatile. And that's what's allowed us, I think, those of us who are making a living as musicians, to do it is you have to be able to play different kinds of music and go in the studio and, and, and play funk or rock or Brazilian or a ballad or a soundtrack for a movie or sound effects. Whatever it is, you've got to be able to address it. Mm -hmm. So... That means you gotta you gotta study. You gotta you gotta take advantage of whatever resources are around you for studying, for reading, for learning with teachers and and whatever elders in the areas that you need to learn that are around. That you get with them. That you talk to them. That you find out what you know they can what they can add to your palate. You know that you could then mm -hmm. evolve. You know you get a lot of ideas of of what to study and how to study. And then you have to remain an eternal student. Perpetual student. That's uh, we started this conversation before I turned on the camera. I've gotten to collaborate with a lot of great artists like you, and and the truly great ones, 
they're number one they're fans and number two they're always perpetual students and that's definitely you john santos uh, no end to it there's no end i mean i don't see how anybody could look at it differently and that's a mistake that some people will make too they yeah. think that they learn something that they got it down and then they know that and then they can do something else but you know you got to really stay open to learning in all of these areas mm -hmm. Well, John, thank you so much for taking time. Um, you know, it's an honor to get to know you a little better. I'm sure folks that see these uh, interviews will realize what a deep resource you really are. Uh, so on behalf of San Jose Jazz and Mr. Latin Jazz, thank you very much. You're so welcome. Thank you, Arturo, for all that you do for us as well.